Assistance Office, part of the Department of Employment and Economic Development. We are glad you're here on a very lovely Tuesday. Um, we are going to be talking about workforce strategy in today's meeting, and I will hand it off to my colleague, Neela Malgar. Well, hello, greetings. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we have been doing these calls every month for our small business community. Uh, we're gathering partners across the state and our, our small businesses. So you have a, a platform to learn about relevant topics, ask each other questions, ask those that are joining the call questions. Um, and so we're just trying to, to make it easier for you to navigate and grow your business. So thank you, Mark, for hosting these meetings and we're excited uh, for the topic today. Thank you. You are welcome. Let's invite our guest. <laughs> and I, I don't have a good pronunciation of your name. So if you would please go ahead, I would appreciate that. No problem. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Adeshewa Adeseji. I am with DEED, Department of Employment and Economic Development. I am the Workforce Strategy Consultant uh, here in the metro area. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for coming. And if you want, we can go right into your information. We'd appreciate it. Okay, let me go ahead and share. Well, it might take a while to upload. All right, and let me know if you see it. Almost. Those poor kids, they were looking for Joe. Yeah. And then it was, um, they go, come back. Yeah, I can see. Okay. All right. So, yes. So, once again, good afternoon. My name is Adeshewa Adeseji, we're for strategy consultant with uh, DEED. Um, I cover the seven county metro area. What I do is I work with employers, I'm helping them to develop strategies for recruiting and retaining workforce talent. Um, so one of the uh, specialties or one of the things that I like to talk to employers about is really that outreach and engaging with BIPOC and other underrepresented groups, talent pools, um, especially those in industries where um, those numbers are, are low. So I'm excited to share this presentation with you today. You know, hopefully you'll take some good points and tips, you know, for growing your diverse workforce. You know, these talking points that I'll share with you today are the same talking points that I discuss with employers, anywhere from small to large uh, businesses that are, are interested in outreach and engaging with those underrepresented or BIPOC communities here in the uh, metro area. So here's the agenda for the presentation. I know I have 30 minutes, so um, I will try to go through this pretty quickly while still giving you guys kind of time to process um, what I'm talking about. Um, so we'll start out with just some data for the metro area. Uh, we'll go into uh, employer-driven versus candidate-driven markets. We'll talk about essentials for recruiting and retaining talent, um, building a diverse workforce, recruiting a diverse workforce, retaining a div diverse workforce, and then where does one start? So if you have uh, had the chance of um, seeing me do any presentations in the past, there's two things I always like to include. And then of course, data. So I really love using this uh, quote. I think it kind of sums up just what's going on with um, that outreach to those communities. If you exclude 50% of the talent pool or 50% of the pool, it's no wonder you find yourself in a war for talent. So from my knowledge, Teresa Whitmarsh is still the executive director of the Washington State Investment Board. So this isn't an old uh, quote. I'm sure it's something that she uses uh, today. So let's go ahead and start with um, data. So in the metro area, as you can see, you know, between 2011 and 2022, uh, we see that um, white, non-Hispanic or Latino and American Indian and Alaskan Native were the only two groups to see a decrease. Um, you see among Black, African-American, Asian, other Pacific Islander, some other race, 
Hispanic or Latino origin, and then especially two or more races, you see that there were uh, significant jumps. The largest jump, of course, being two or more races uh, between 2011 and 2022, it jumped by 159.6%, which is a lot. Um, if we also look at future workforce, um, looking at um, uh, population projections between 2020 and 2060, once again, you see that the only decrease are occurring among the American Indian and Alaska Native populations, but really look at the white, not Hispanic or Latino population. That's expected to go from 71.2% to 51.2%. So that's the largest decrease. Whereas if you see all of the other groups, they're going to be facing increases. The Black and African American, uh, Asian or other Pacific Islander, two or more races, and then Hispanic or Latino uh, origin of any race. Then if we look at uh, the role of migration, uh, because as we know, new Americans, immigrant refugees, you know, there is a focus on uh, recruiting those talent pools into um, the workforce as well. So if you look at the change between 2020, 2022, you see that the international net migration saw an increase in both the Twin Cities, but also uh, in Minnesota uh, as a whole. Whereas if you look at the domestic net migration for both the Twin Cities and Minnesota, there was um, a decrease. Now, it, I'll just read some data uh, from our LMI office. The metro area has a large foreign-born population estimated at nearly 380,000 people in 2022. Where the metro area accounts for 55% of Minnesota's total population, the total accounts or the region accounts for 78% of Minnesota's total foreign-born population. The foreign-born population in the metro area is growing rapidly. Between 2010 and 2022, this population expanded in the region by 29.3% or about 86,000 people. The total population expanded by 10.5 during this time. A significant share of the foreign born population in the metro area falls within the prime working years. So that's ages of those between 25 and 54 years old. This share, 61.9% compares to the 40.9% for the total population. In other words, a high share of foreign-born population in the region uh, is at that age where they are ready, ready, willing, and able to work. While the Twin Cities metro area has witnessed a negative domestic migration patterns in recent years, it has witnessed a positive international migration uh, between 20, 2020 and 2022, or um, as I had talked uh, mentioned previously. So, you know, in the end, what does this mean? You know, while the makeup of today's workers have more similarities and differences, businesses should expect tomorrow's talent pool to be more diverse. And therefore, that's the reason why when I talk to employers, I strongly suggest and encourage them to outreach and to engage with those populations, to increase awareness of those of their existence with those populations. So when those younger folks in those um, groups become older and they're working age, and even those that are working age now, um, they will, you know, consider those companies as well when they're looking for uh, employment or a career. So currently, there's also five generations representing today's workforce. Uh, Generation Alpha, which is not included in this uh, diagram right now, represents uh, young youth ages zero to 10 years, will be in the workforce as little as six years. You know, each of these generations has its own priorities and expectations um, from leaders of their organizations. So uh, according to recent estimates from the U.S. Census Bureau American Community Survey, uh, millennials make up the largest cohort in the labor force with about 608,000 workers, followed by Generation X with 600,000 workers. You know, at the front end, the baby boomer generation has started uh, reaching retirement age uh, the number of baby boomers have dropped just to over 324,000 workers, and there are still about a little over 10,000 workers age 76 or older. Uh, Generation Z is just entering the workforce, but has already provided um, or has already uh, provided nearly 234,000 workers. So not only is there uh, diversity with 
uh, race and ethnicity, you also see uh, diversity within the generations. And as I tell businesses, um, there are different ways and approaches and different expectations from these generations when it comes to recruiting and, and retaining them as talent for your businesses. So what does diversity look like in the workplace? When we think about diversity, we usually think about the column on the left-hand side. We look at race and ethnicity, cultural background, gender, sexual orientation, age, religious, spiritual beliefs, disability, and then social economic status. Well, the column on the right also um, could, we could look at that as also diversity in the workplace as well. So looking at marital status, parental status, citizenship status, criminal background, military experience, personality and thought style, social roles and ideologies. So, you know, when we think about diversity, I try to tell businesses, look beyond race and ethnicity and age and look at all of these factors. Um, someone that is married might have a different mindset and in, 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 uh, thoughts than someone that is single. Um, what are the thoughts and the attitudes of someone that has kids versus someone that does not have kids in the workplace? And it's important for businesses to understand that diversity, uh, there's a plethora of factors that uh, make up diversity in the workplace. And it's important to make sure that no matter what one or multiple categories your workers fall under, that that inclusion and feeling uh, being a part of that uh, employment or that business is important. So when I talk to businesses, I usually say, okay, we're usually in two type of, uh, of talent markets. Um, we're either in the employer driven market or a candidate driven market. So an employer driven market is in a market where employers are at an advantage. So businesses are in the control of the hiring process. Employers can negotiate salaries and benefits as a result of the slowing of economies, the rise of unemployment, and the increase of people looking for work. So usually in an employer-driven market, there are more individuals looking for work than there are available work. The opposite is for a candidate-driven workforce. In that workforce, it's when candidates or even current employees are at the advantage. Uh, there are more job opportunities than talent. So candidates have the power or the upper hand with negotiating pay, benefits, requesting more from the employer as a result of companies competing for high-skilled high candidates. So um, if you could take a wild guess and say that we're currently in a candidate-driven market, you would be correct. So in the end, increasing diversity in your company means considering five factors. Now, in the past, we always focus on just diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI. Well, now we have to add accessibility and belonging. You know, the efforts a company makes towards diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging in the workplace can determine the level of success when recruiting and retaining employees, especially those from marginalized and underrepresented groups. So as you can see, diversity is considered the range of human differences encompassing the characteristics that make one individual or group different from another. Uh, equity is the fair treatment, access, access, opportunity, and advancement of all people. Inclusion is the intentional, proactive, and continuing efforts and practices in which all members respect, support, and value others. Accessibility is the design, construction, development, and maintenance of facilities, information, and communication technology programs and services so that all people, including people with disabilities, are fully and independently, uh, can fully and independently use them. And then belonging is the secure feeling of being valued within and making valuable contribution, contributions to a team. So it's important that not only that you think and consider diversity, equity, and inclusion, but you're also looking at accessibility and belonging as well. So usually there are seven essentials for recruiting and uh, retaining workforce talents or factors that employers should consider when recruiting and retaining, and you know, it's workforce talent. You know, I always encourage employers to work. Uh, I always encourage employers that I work with to review these essentials on a regular basis just to make sure that they're up to um, they're up to par and that it's benefiting them and it's resulting in an increase in recruiting and an increase in retaining their talent. 
So what we have, we have career development opportunities, making sure that there are opportunities there uh, for career development. The candidate experience. The candidate experience starts from when you post your job to when you offer uh, that employment to that candidate. How was that process? That process including posting the job, interviewing, keeping up to speed with, um, or keeping up to date with that candidate, um, making sure that you're very transparent with that candidate through that process. Uh, effective and supportive management, making sure that management is supportive of its um, employees and supervisors and leadership. Uh, company culture, what is the company culture? Is the company culture one that's inviting? Um, is the company culture one where people feel like they belong, that they can contribute? Uh, Work-life balance, that's very important, making sure that your workers have a healthy work-life balance. A uh, strong compensation and recognition program, especially for a lot of the older generations looking at that compensation, recognition, uh, what are, you know, b pay, benefits, other perks um, that they would receive um, from your company. And then last, diversity, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging. So there are a plethora of essentials. These are usually the top seven or the ones that I really talk to the employers the most about when we're uh, talking about recruiting and retaining talent. So what are the benefits of building your diverse workforce? You know, by now uh, you've heard many conversations and have been in plenty of, you know, webinars and have seen plenty of presentations where this subject has come up. Building a diverse workforce, diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and belonging, needing to reach out to those um, BIPOC and other uh, underrepresented groups. Well, what is the benefit of it? Well, there's a couple of benefits. Um, of course, uh, for the sake of time, I did not include all of them because then this would be a, probably a four hour presentation, but just some of them I decided to include. So uh, one, some of the benefits, increased competitiveness, increased productivity, increased creativity, creating a strong company reputation, which is very important, especially if you're a smaller business, Increasing awareness and having a positive representation or reputation in the community is important. A uh, wider range of experiences and skill sets. Uh, there are groups that maybe you haven't considered that you're now recruiting and they bring a whole new set of experiences and skill sets that you never thought of and it's benefiting your company. Uh, dispelling the negative stereotypes and biases about your company or industry. When I think of this one, I think about the manufacturing industry. Right now, it is primarily white, non-Hispanic or Latino male. And so increasing diversity in that in industry can help to dispel some of those negative stereotypes and myths about that industry. And then lastly, it increases diverse customer base, especially if you're a B2C customer. Um, uh, a lot of um, consumers, especially younger consumers, they're more likely to do business with your company if they know that your workforce reflects the population. Or if, you're, if they know that if your workforce reflects who you're seeking or who your customers are, they're most likely to continue doing business with you. So those are just some of the um, perks and benefits of, of looking at building a diverse workforce. So recruiting uh, more diverse candidates. Once again, did not want to put all of uh, the different um, ways to recruit more diverse candidates. I only have 30 minutes and not an hour, uh, four hours. So um, some of the things that I tell businesses, there are no, there is no one size fits all strategy for recruiting. Um, what works for one company, even in the same industry, might not work for your company. So there's no one size fits all. Uh, go to them. Don't wait for them to come to you. Uh, when this was an employer driven market and employers had the upper hand because there were more people looking for work than opportunities, employers were able to sit back and people would come to them. Now you have to go to them. You have to extend that out of the branch. You have to be engaged in that community, um, in that, in with that group. Um, go to them. Don't wait for them to come to you. Access your can uh, access your candidate experience process. Are there some ways to make that a better process or better experience for that candidate? Maybe. 
that process during that process, a lot of qualified skilled candidates are dropping off because there might be a procedure that you have that's really turning people off to continuing with that process. So constantly seeing, okay, is my candidate driven process the process uh, that I want to have for my company? And is it, it the, is the result of it me having more people uh, interested in working for my company? Um, incre uh, frequently use frequent review of your company's job postings. I always say that the message is the message that you're sending out the same message that the target audience is receiving. So constantly looking to make sure, OK, what is the message? What is the conversation through that job posting? Because remember, that's your first line of marketing and communications to those uh, job seekers. So what what is the underlying message your job postings are saying? Uh, increasing the use of social media and other outlets for multi-generational uh, multi generational outreach. Um, I know, you know, in the news, TikTok has been in the news a lot. And, you know, there's there's an attempt to to um, close down uh, TikTok. But for a lot of the younger generations, that's where they really go to to get information. So our companies using TikTok to promote their jobs, to reach out to those younger generations. Whereas maybe for older generations, it's more of the LinkedIn, it's more of the Facebook. So really use a wide range of social media. Uh, engaging with organizations and associations, working with the groups that you're targeting. Uh, encourage employee referrals. If you have a very good um, uh, employee base, uh, you ever heard of that saying, uh, birds of a feather flock together? You know, if they're going to refer someone to that company, it's more likely they're going to have those skill sets and that mindset of that employee. So really encourage employee referrals. Uh, review your company website. Once again, is your audience receiving the correct message? Uh, check your biases at the door. Check your microaggressions at the door as well, but definitely checking your biases at the door. Um, offering mentorships internships, and then what we like to call returnships. So for those workers returning to the workforce or even returning to that particular industry, are there returnships? And it's easy. If you can build a mentorship, if you can build an internship, you can build a program and call it a returnship. And then remain transparent during the recruiting process. If a candidate has a question and they send you an email on Monday, respond by Tuesday. Um, when candidates don't receive, feel like they're not being taken serious, seriously, or their questions are being unanswered, that's where you start losing them between, uh, they fall between the cracks. So now we talked about recruiting, let's talk about retaining. Uh, and, or as I like to say, you got them, now how do you keep them? Uh, businesses have to understand that retaining workers are just as important as recruiting workers. And you want to have some practices in place to retain those workers. So once again, a few of those promoting a live to work or sorry, promoting a work to live, not live to work environment, um, making diversity a part of your company's culture. So if you don't have employee resource groups to really look into um, establishing employee resource groups and employee resource groups doesn't mean that you have to start off with 75 um, employees in this employer resource group. If there's two, then start with two. It doesn't matter what the number is when you start, as long as you start and build an employee resource group or groups. Uh, celebrate the cultural differences. Everyone wants to feel like, you know, their culture, uh, who they are, is appreciated in the workplace. Motivate and recognition of employees. Make sure that they get that recognition. Uh, prepare management and leadership. And so this is a lot of things that businesses overlook as well. Uh, sometimes you have, and I'll go back to the manufacturing uh, example. If you are used to uh, managing or leading a group of um, workers that are the same, so in this case, white, non-Hispanic, Latino males, and now you have more BIPOC workers, you have more women, you have individuals with disabilities. Um, sometimes, you know, management and leaderships, they're not prepared for that. So making sure that you prepare them as well for that change. And that because you're managing or leading a group that has more similarities now, doesn't necessarily mean that in six months in a year, that group is gonna look the same. So preparing them for that. 
uh, cultivate strong relationships between staff and management and leadership. As I like to say, really get rid of the ivory tower um, scenario. And so um, staff should not feel that management and leadership is hard to get to and hard to communicate with and vice versa. Really encourage uh, those relationships and that open door policy. Encourage employee involvement and feedback in daily operations. Now, I know that some of the operations you can't involve uh, staff all the time, but when it's possible, get their thoughts, get their opinions. If there's opportunities to volunteer to be a part of this group or this group, you know, extend that invitation out to your staff. Um, they'll appreciate it. Uh, support skill growth with opportunities for career advancement. Once again, you know, once you got them, not keeping them stagnant in an entry level. Um, diversity, you know, is not only within the your employee base as a whole, but within your company. So if you see uh, an employee that has that potential, um, work with them and develop a, a career pathway for them to get from entry level to management to, to leadership. Uh, perform exit and stay interviews. You know, employers always focus on exit interviews, why people leave. You focus on why people stay or ask why people stay. And you use the information that you get as to why people stay and you use it for your recruiting. So for example, if you hear over and over again, people stay because of the flexibility, because of the relationship with management and leadership, that's what you promote when you're recruiting uh, for more workers, is that we're a company that's flexible. We're a company that believes in, you know, uh, we we don't believe in silos and our goal is to break those silos between staff and management and leadership. And then lastly, be a caring and an attentive employer, just to be an overall caring employer. Um, your workers outside of their personal life spends the majority of their hours a day, a week, a month, a year, what have you, in the work environment. Um, you know, that's a lot of hours. That's a lot of hours away from family, away from friends. Being a caring employer, an attentive employer, uh, a supportive employer, that's the way of retaining your workers. So, you know, where does it start? You know, it just starts with a plan. Um, definitely buy-in and support from leadership. Um, if you are, you know, a manager of a team and you have this great idea, but you don't have support from leadership, it usually will fall flat right there. So making sure you get buy-in and support from your company's leadership. Um, assessing your company's uh, workplace. What is the current culture? What are some of those areas that are in need for improvement? And what are some things you can start doing to work towards improving those? those practices or things that you see uh, currently um, occurring in the workplace. Identify barriers affecting the growth of your workforce. Is it those biases? Is it those microaggressions? Is it managers and, leaders and leadership um, or supervisors and managers not being used to um, managing uh, diverse employees? Like what are some of those barriers? Uh, getting everyone involved, once again, from entry level to C-suite uh, leadership. If they have an interest and they want to um, work towards making this um, company a better place for current and future workers, get them involved. Nine times out of 10, if they are volunteering and they want to be a part of the discussion and part of the work, they're looking at staying at that company long term. And so you should get them involved. Uh, brainstorm policies that would appeal to your targeted audience and align with your goals. Remain transparent throughout the journey. I had mentioned that before. Transparency is so important. That is really a frustration. Um, before working with employers, I worked with job seekers, and that was something that I heard from job seekers all the time. The frustration of not knowing where the next steps are, where they were at. They heard one time from the employer, and then I didn't hear from them again until Five months down the line, they got a letter saying, well, thank you for applying, but we went with someone else. Remain transparent with that, uh, with that job seeker. Antici anticipate a few attempts before success. Nothing is ever successful the first time. So if you try it the first time and you don't fail or you don't succeed, just look at where you failed at or the things that need improvement, modify those and try again. Sometimes it takes a while or it takes a couple of attempts before you find success. And then definitely measure and move forward. Um, 
you know, record those metrics. Make sure that you have some accountability or you put some accountability towards your company. There's some goals that we want to achieve in six months, a year, year and a half, two years, and make sure that you measure those and you move forward, always moving forward, never being stagnant or moving backwards. So what are the steps to building a DEI plan? Um, you know, whether employers are going at it individually or collectively as an industry, you know, there are steps in the process. So this particular roadmap that I put together has five steps. You know, um, it is possible for your company um, to might need fewer steps or more steps. Um, no matter what, you know, this is not an overnight process. Um, it takes a lot of talking, it takes a look at assessing, looking inward, and then developing that roadmap. And then once again, nine times out of 10, you're not going to succeed the first time. But it's not about stopping or quitting if you don't succeed. It's about figuring out what you need to modify, modify it, and keep moving, uh, moving forward. And that's how you're going to find that success is as you come to those roadblocks, modify uh, and keep it moving, as we like to say. So with that, I would like to end with another quote that I found. Once again, I'm a, a, a consultant that loves using quotes in my uh, presentations. Uh, employers who recognize the importance of investing in their workforce have a more productive workforce, a more efficient workforce, a more loyal workforce, less turnover, and in the private sector, more profitable. So with that, um, this is information about our team, the Workforce Strategy Consultants. Um, as you can see, um, there are now six of us. Um, our Southwest and South Central um, Consultant is now our director. We do have um, a new person, sorry, they haven't updated our um, marketing materials yet, but you can go to Deed, um, the Deeds website or the CareerForceMN.com website, and you can find the information. And if you have companies um, in other regions, or if you know of any other companies in other regions that would love to talk to a workforce strategy consultant to develop some strategies for recruiting and retaining talent in that area, please reach out to uh, those individuals. I'd also like to say, um, like to invite all of you to attend. Um, our monthly webinars. So every first Wednesday of the month, we have a webinar called Workforce Wednesday, and it's when we talk about different topics that pertain to workforce. And so um, what it consists of is an hour-long webinar where we have a panel of three to five subject matter experts that talk about that particular subject, followed by a 30-minute what we call unplug session where the audience is uh, uh, able to unmute their microphones and ask questions to either the panelists or the workforce strategy consultants that pertain to that topic. So with that, I thank you very much. I hope um, I know I went through this pretty quickly, but I hope that you guys were able to um, process and absorb some of the information. And I believe um, I will send this to one of you to uh, be able to share with the group. So with that, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me. That's my email or you can ask me right now. Yeah, people feel feel free to raise your hand, unmute and, and ask any questions. Thank you for the presentation. That was very helpful. Thank you. Hi, Ashel McKinney here with Hennepin County. Can you put in the chat the link to the workforce wednesdays information yes it is i will it's do in that. twice oh well, thank mm -hmm. you wonderful perfect okay. Oh, isn't there? Okay. Great. hello yeah. uh my name is constance and i'm listening by phone because i couldn't like log in uh i don't know the chat or anything this is my first time how can sure. i get that information can I get it by email? Because I don't have I'm not, I, I don't have access to the chat or whatever. Because I'm listening by phone. I log in my phone. And thank you for having that option. Because I could just log in. Yeah, I do believe for the workforce Wednesday, I do have the link on the um, on the the slide, and then I will uh, send this to you um, to one of you, and and you can share it with with the group. 
Sure. Yes, we also have the meetings recording. Um, that's in the uh, upper part of the the chat. But yeah, we will we'll get the information to people. Um, Adeshi, okay. we have a we have a question here. We're starting a new starting in a new location or a new location in Minnesota and plan to hire new staff locally. Can you share more details about the incentives for that? I'm sorry. Can you repeat yourself? I was hearing the yep. from that. Sorry. Oh, no problem. We have someone asking. We're starting a new uh, location in Minnesota and plan to hire new staff locally. Can you share more details about incentives for that? Um, incentives meaning um, just people to reach out to or how to connect. Um, if they don't mind following up with that, what area are they planning to uh, open their location? Is it here in the metro? Uh, let's see. The response was likely metro. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so so how I would approach it is, is definitely would want to you know maybe do a um, a separate um, conversation with you, which I can go over you know some of the incentives. So some of the things you know connecting you to local resources. So depending on what county you're in, getting you connected with the uh, county uh, workforce board. So the workforce board is made up of employers and other stakeholders in workforce yep. development. So they really know what's going on in that area. I'm um, also um, looking at what are your short term, long term goals, depending on what that is, you know, um, connecting you to our Minnesota Job Skills Partnership um, uh, team. And so those are grants to help you with rescaling or upskilling, you know, developing career pathways, um, connecting based, depending on the uh, the grant that you apply to, connecting you either with an educator in that area or with a community based organization in that area um, and to uh, build that career pathway and use those dollars to recruit and to retain and like I said, rescale or upskill workers. Um, there's a lot of different things, and it, it does depend on when I talk to the employers, you know, what their short term, long term goals are. So for the individual that had asked that question, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'd love to, you know, set up maybe a 30 minute and get more information and then I can kind of hone down uh, what incentives and what resources um, that you might want to to look into. Cool. Thank you. That that would be very helpful. We have another question here from Dominic. He had one question answered already by Liz Jennings. But the second question here is, we've been looking for a local Class A driver. Are there any good areas to look for a driver? Yeah, now with that, as you had mentioned, uh, Liz Jennings. So Liz Jennings uh, is our employer engagement mm -hmm. specialist with CareerForceMN.com. And usually um, for those uh, researchers, um, I would like to refer employers um, to her. She really has, you know, a really boot on the ground, the relationship with um, a lot of those, and she just waved uh, with um, those resources. And so um, while I don't know off the top of my head, those um, she would definitely be um, a resource to connect with. So I would, Liz, and I don't mean to, to put that work off on you, but if you would put your information <laughs> in the chat, um, I would suggest connecting with her to get that that information. All right, thank you. Um, I, we put in the chat, Neela, just try to put it in the chat, the um, uh, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, the, the Grow Minnesota, um, their publication, its Guide to Workforce Resources. It was already put in the chat once. Let me see if I can, I can at least put in the link for the publication um, to get the information about it. Let me just throw that in there. Uh, with that, I'll admit one more person to the meeting. Uh, with that, I don't see any other questions. I, I see um, one more. Yeah. Um, I think uh, from Hennepin County, unless she just still has her hand up. Sure, yeah, whatever you see, let's let's do it. I can unmute, Mm-hmm. I already got my question answered. Thanks. Oh, oh okay. Great. Well, you know, I, I once again, thank you so much for um, allowing me to present. Um, this is my information. Like I said, I will send um, I will send you guys this presentation. Uh, feel free to reach out. 
uh, if you want to schedule, like I said, just a quick 30 minute, to, uh, even an hour meeting just to get some more information. Um, you know, one of the one of the roles that I have too is also connecting you to those resources. So whether it's Liz Jennings or as I mentioned, um, one of the workforce development boards in the area or a community-based organization or another organization that um, will you know, align with the efforts or, the, or what you're looking for, um, you know, that's my job and, and I will be more than happy to do that. So definitely reach out to me. <laughs> Thank you, okay. you are a great uh, resource. Before you leave, hello, yes. before you leave, uh, so I'm the one that on the phone, so uh, where I get the information by email, because definitely I would like to like talk to you, maybe schedule a 30 minute or one hour, you know, to get more information and see the direction. So, uh, but I'm not in the group or whatever I know I'm. So, how will I get the information like that you put in the chat room now? Um, you said you do have an email, right? So, are you part of the email list? Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm uh, gonna email email this presentation, which includes my contact information, um, and they'll send it okay. out to the group, and then you can reach out okay. to me. And I, I just. The only other request that I have is that if you guys reach out to me, uh, just re um, refer to this meeting as well. So I know, okay. oh, okay, it's from the small business uh, presentation I did. And, and I okay, guess I thank to... you. Small... Okay, thank you. No problem. I, want to re I just want to reiterate what Mark shared too. The best way is to go online. We'll be recording this and you'll see, you know, you can put your email to in the chat. It's your emails in the PowerPoint. So it's sometimes hard to get all the questions back to all the participants. So we, we really want to make sure that the that if you have additional questions to look back on the website uh, for these recorded meetings. OK, thank you. All right, is there any other any other questions regarding uh, talent recruitment and workforce or is there other questions that your business is having that others on the call might be able to answer for you? All right. Well, with that, thank you again. I mean, this was a wonderful. I appreciate the time to talk to this wonderful group and thank you, Neela, for for the invitation. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for taking time to share your knowledge. And we know every time we talk to a, a business, talent is is a is a key concern. So we wanted to make sure that we brought in experts uh, that could help share some insights. So thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all of you that are, took time out of your day to attend. We also want to thank our partners, SBDC and Minnesota Chamber and others that uh, help uh, with the content and, and sharing out this information to others. So, uh, Mark, anything else on your end? Um, not from here, but we will give you a brief glimpse at what we're going to do in May. We're going to have um, representatives from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency come and speak. Uh, there are some new rulemakings that will affect possibly some small businesses as far as dealing with uh, pollution. And then I believe they can also probably touch on the number of different funds that they have available for small businesses. So that will be coming up in May. Last chance for questions in the chat or jump off the mic. Jeff. Anything else? OK. Uh, yeah, uh, Christina mentioned the Sadbach uh, Procurement Fair Thursday. I'm looking forward to being there, too, with you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will see you next month, the second Tuesday at 2 o'clock. All right. Bye, everybody. And we'll get the meeting posted as soon as it becomes available. Thanks.